I'm Joe Melvin. I'm the director of the estate of Barry Flanagan. Barry Flanagan's a very interesting artist. A lot of people know his work through the iconography of the hare. And a lot of people think that the hare is the principal component of Barry Flanagan's work. Um, this is really not the case. Though the hare is a significant part of his work, it certainly isn't the only element at all and Barry's work has been involved in a kind of quixotic form of practice right from the very beginning. His interest in pataphysics is a key and a clue and a way in to his thinking. It also explains how it was that the hair became such a significant feature for him and such an important um, means to embody feeling, material, investigation. Pataphysics is the science of imaginary solutions. It is the phrases coined by the symbolist poet and playwright Alfred Jarry. And when Barry Fenegan was a young man, when he was um, living in Bristol, some poet friends of his gave him a copy of the Evergreen Review, which was dedicated to pataphysics. And from that time onwards, from the early 60s, from 1963, Barry Fenegan was entirely involved in pataphysical thinking. So the science of imaginary solutions opens up the possibility for inhabiting different positions. It opens the possibility for positive and negative, for things that are figurative and non-figurative. For example, the differentiation between figuration and non-figuration <clears throat> was a designation that Barry considered to be arbitrary and irrelevant. So the investigation is a material one. It involves viscosity, it involves feeling, and this is what is central to his practice. Barry Flanagan um, started his studies as an architecture student in uh, Birmingham, Birmingham Art School, and he switched after a year to sculpture. And he did another year of sculpture studies before he finished at that, at that school. And then he worked in a variety of different um, forms. He, uh, he drove a van, he stuffed donuts in a bakery, um, he worked on a building site in Montreal, he learnt to pour concrete, he, he learnt all trade or the trade of the building industry. Um, and then after a couple of years he went to St Martin's and he, he took a, uh, had a scholarship to study on the advanced sculpture course with Anthony Caro. And uh, Flanagan, from, from the beginning of his student days with Caro, um, questioned the um, <clears throat> sort of the commitment to formalist thinking, the commitment to a particular m way of making sculpture that was metal, um, that was steel, strong sculptural forms. And he considered that sculpture could be silent. Sculpture could be about sound. Sculpture could be about the absence of sound. Sculpture could be soft. Sculpture could be performance. So from those early student days, Flanagan was actually involved in performance as part of sculptural practice. And he investigated in using different materials. So counter to the prevailing attitude of the school at the time, he was doing a lot of work in clay. Clay was considered to be taboo because it wasn't hard. Um, and Flanagan um, relished that subversion um, and relished the possibility of exploration of sculptural media. Um, he was a very gifted student and he graduated with distinction. And one of the, uh, one of the in immediate consequences was that he was offered an exhibition having just graduated at the Rowan Gallery, a solo exhibition, which was a pretty impressive um, opportunity for a recent graduate. And he had a, this exhibition in the gallery, and the gallery had carpet on the floor. And surprisingly, the carpet was green. Um, it was in a, a well-to-do part of London where it wouldn't be unusual to have carpet on the floor. Flanagan made a sand sculpture which rested on the carpet. Now, in 1966, having sand on the carpet was quite shocking for people. And Flanagan had a sack of sand which he poured 
directly onto the floor. So a hundred weight of sand from the sack poured onto the floor. When the sand had finished pouring, um, Flanagan scooped from the top of the sand pile in four directions, north, south, west, and east. So scooping out. This sculpture was called Ring N, the N joining the G, Ring N 66. So he made a kind of shorthand, and the N stands for kind of the negative of the space that has been taken, that has been removed, the sand that isn't there. It also st stands for the, the shape of that negative space. It's emblematic, it's mysterious what it is. The, the actual date of the work is part of the title as well. And Flanagan's early practice was to include dates as part of the title. The, the title itself for this exhibition comes from a notation that Barry made. Barry made a lot of notations um, in, in both in notebooks but also on, on pieces of paper. And he um, had, a, had a, a headed paper which has a hair stamp on the paper. And on this, in the early 90s, he wrote the hair as metaphor. And this inscription really became a, a, a way, a means to make this exhibition because the hair as metaphor is so open-ended, it doesn't have a beginning or, or an end, and it can refer to any of the work in the, in, in the exhibition, whether we're talking about the pile or heap or, or a work that is the hair. We could be talking about the, the, the film Sand Girl. The hair is extremely uh, emblematic. It is happy, sad, brilliant, funny, alarming, beautiful. The hair changes. The hair is almost like a surrogate for our existence, a means to explore sexuality, a means to explore terror, delight. Um, it also is a means to investigate the practices of other sculptors, like, um, like the Nijinsky hair and the thinker of Rodin. So Rodin's thinker and, and Nijinsky transformed into a hair. These, these elements became, well, Flanagan first started working, first referenced um, Rosa in, in the mid-80s, in 1985. Um, and the pathos of the thinker is something that we can relate to, and in a way we can relate to perhaps more closely because it isn't representative of a person in a sense. And the, the, the gates of hell in the Rodin sculpture become completely transformed in monument. Well, calling the word monument is, of course, a reference. Um, but it's oblique. And you have the, 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 the thinking hair sitting in the monument. The monument in itself has a, a figuration, a sort of viscosity of human form, which can be seen to be referencing Flanagan's own investigations of sculptural form with his film Sand Girl, when he has the sand falling on the top of a woman, of a model, and it's a form of sculpting in practice. But, and you have the legs, the extraordinary quality of the legs with the, with the formation of the, the body in the, in, the gates, in, the, in, the, in the monument, reference to the gates of hell. So the figures at the top of Rodin's um, sculpture are abject and sad. And here they're transformed into this extraordinarily vigorous, vibrant, dynamic, and slightly sort of kooky dancing hair, Nijinsky. And colour, too. Colour is very, is very important in the, the practice. Um, there, are, there, there are pataphysical overtones in the relationship of colour. Green is the colour of vitality, of sexuality, and of life in pataphysics. Um, and you see green in many of the works. You see green in the blankets, you see green in the sacks, you see green in the collages, you see red, yellow, blue, the richness of the blue of the daylight light piece, for instance, the piece of, of Hessian, which is dyed blue. Um, colour features in the rope, which is dyed red. Um, 
there is a, a lightness of touch in his approach to colour. The colour is very simple as well. It's not sort of complicated, but it, it resonates very strongly and takes on its own life. In this exhibition, there are a number of um, very clear instances of text in the work itself. So <clears throat> in, the, in the juggler, um, written on the plinth, and the plinth is part of the sculpture itself, are the words, hello, Joseph, he cried. And this is a reference to a drawing by Jack Yates of a juggler. Um, and Flanagan came from a family of, um, which, which had people working in the circus in it. He had an uncle who was a high wire artist, and he was steeped in the kind of performance tradition of, of circus acts. And so juggling, of course, would appeal to him. Also the act of juggling, juggling with materials, juggling with, with ideas, juggling with drawing people in to look at the sculpture. So hello, Joseph, he cried, is a reference, both a reference to the act of juggling, to Jack Yates, and also to a sort of like an opportunity, an overture, a, a, a means of bringing someone in. Text also features in the shape of the, the spirals. The spiral comes very directly from pataphysics. Um, the figure of Ubu in Ubu Wa, Pierre Ubu, um, Jerry's play, has a spiral on his belly. Um, the spiral is something that is kind of intrinsic to Fanagan's practice. I mean, when he made a film, which is in the exhibition, called A Hole in the Sea, Fanagan was, was situating a plexiglass cylinder in the sea, and as, as the tide comes in, the water goes round and round, you know, in the spiral of, of draining, um, and all, or the, the quixotic impossibility of bagging the sea or of making a hole in the sea comes into this imaginary solutions proposition. So the, the spirals feature on a number, of, a number of sculptures and you see, the, you see the kind of linearity of spiral form even in these kind of uh, works that riff on min minimalism as with, as with pile the pile of Hessian folded cloths, pile of blankets. You see the sort of spiral shape. In the Road to Altissimo, you see the spiral, you see the spiral carved into the, into the marble very closely. So a very close relationship to text and to language. So I, f I, first, I first came across Barry Fenegan's work in the Tate Gallery, as it was called then, in the um, downstairs part, the basement part, where new work was put out recently acquired new works were put out and at the end of the 70s well actually in 1976 the work pile was acquired by the Tate Gallery and a couple of years after that I was going along there as a teenager and I, I found this incredible work a work of art that was a pile of blankets and I thought if someone can make a pile of blankets as a work of art art is something I want to be involved in it was an amazing revelation <laughs>